middle school pupils at, at our university in a huge aula, and you could see some, well, actually you can see some pictures from these lectures. It was really marvelous. I mean, it was a great experience to be there in that lecture. So we have a real master of, of this here with us. Um, uh, I should sit down, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, in addition to this, I'd like to say that, that his, his interests are very broad, not only in science and science teaching, science communication, philosophy, psychology, but then it also reaches until uh, philosophy and theology. He's got, a, uh, I think, his Master of Arts in Theology and Pastoral Structures, and as a matter of fact, is a priest with the, uh, uh, in the Church of England. That's right. Um, the home team. Yeah. Uh, and he has, he has also brought international collaboration with not only Slovakia, but also with Poland and South Africa. And, and, and we're colleagues, or my colleagues at the department are colleagues and friends with Richard since 1993, I think, a long time already. That's right, we, we've grown up together. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so this is not his first time here. He, he, he's been coming here for many years and, and uh, we're going to, to Sheffield. And um, so I'm very happy that now we also... Yes, there's a question already. That's very good. This is, this is meant to be discussion. Interruption. But you saw that, okay? Tu mamy kroniku, czas w naszej kroniki katedrowej, więc możecie podejść właśnie dokumentację naszej współpracy. Aż tu z dwa albumy, które przyjaciło. Ok. So, um... So by saying this, I'm very happy to welcome you now here also in the scientific cafe that we have here. And I just want to say two organizatorial questions. The cafe is meant to be a discussion, really. I mean, you're welcome to ask questions and comment and, and say what you want. Um, if, I mean, we would recognize that, that somebody might be shy and speak in English. So if you feel you're not fit in formulating your questions or comments in English, you're also welcome to do that in Slovak and we will do our best to translate that. And if you're even shy to, to speak Slovak, then we're ready also for that possibility. You will find on your tables um, little pieces of paper on which you can write your questions and comments and then deliver them in some way to us. And, uh, and I'll try to read it and translate it into English. So, uh, Richard agreed that uh, he prepared something uh, for the beginning to, to talk about, and uh, we can start discussion whenever you feel that, if you would like to say something. Okay, so I'll um, just say one or two things at the beginning, just to uh, get things um, so you know what I'm talking about, I suppose. And um, when we do this in, in Britain, for some strange reason, and I've never understood why, we don't call it a science cafe. We call it Café Scientifique. <laughs> it sounds so much more sophisticated, I think. <laughs> so, um, so, so what I, my job um, is, a, it's a wonderful job really, in many ways, in a university. Um, I'm an academic, I do research, I tend to research into how people learn. Um, but most of my time is spent in making science technology, engineering and mathematics interesting for ordinary people. For or not specialists, but just for ordinary people. I spend a lot of time working with families, um, ordinary people, and I'm responsible for, I suppose, about two million people in South Yorkshire to try and make them interested in science. And that's a really very exciting job. We, we use the phrase, and I'll say this now, I'll say this at the beginning, and it probably needs a little bit of translation, I, I use the word STEM, STEM, starting S-T-E-M, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, okay? And when I do that, I'm really trying to describe a whole lot of things about what we try to interest people in. Not just about science, because the engineers get very upset when we just say science, and the mathematicians get very, very upset when we don't mention mathematics at all. So we try to mention everything there. So, let's move on a little bit. Um, the first picture there is, um, as I said, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, the picture shows three people. The one in the middle is a teacher in a very ordinary kind of school in the region I work. It's actually quite a difficult area, that school. 
It's one where there's a lot of unemployment, where the parents aren't very keen on school generally, and the children probably aren't that keen either. It's a bit of a problem. On the right-hand side, the man in the suit is my colleague, Stuart, who I work with. But the man on the left, is a, in Britain, is very famous. Okay, he's very famous. It's called Johnny Ball. His daughter is more famous now because she's a disc jockey. But Johnny Ball is a television presenter. And his enthusiasm is getting children interested in mathematics. And so we used him quite a bit. He's a good friend now. And uh, he was giving the talk about mathematics, and that's what he was doing there. So that's an example of one kind of thing we do. We send people who are good communicators, good examples of communication, out into the community to do missionary work in the science in there. Um, why do we do it? Now, in a sense, there are, there are several reasons, but the simplest way of saying it, there are three basic reasons why we try to do this. And you might want to think if it's true in Slovakia as well. Uh, the first one is science and technology, STEM, is important for economic reasons. Most of the kind of world we live in has industry that is based on some form of science or technology. And, and increasingly the industry is more and more technical. So it's important that we, we train the next generation of scientists and technologists so that we encourage young people to become scientists and technologists because all countries need to have that important technical base just for economic reasons, otherwise uh, we just run banks or something, I don't know. We need to be able to make things. Uh, the second big reason, I think, is that science is part of our culture. Now, normally in Britain I say that, people just gasp. Um, it's as important to know about, we would say, it's as important to know about Isaac Newton and Einstein as it is to know about Shakespeare and Mozart. They're in culturally important things. It's good that a, a scientific cafe happens in a jazz club. We have no problems going to watch jazz or listen to jazz, but we kind of have a problem going to listen to science, don't we? So it all wants to be part of our culture. It's important. The third reason is what we would call a democratic reason. Um, not in the sense that um, it's political, but in the sense that we all as individuals now have to make decisions for ourselves, which are scientific decisions. Um, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but I imagine that um, if you go into the doctor and the doctor said to you, well, you've got, I don't know, such and such a disease or something, the first thing you would do probably is go home and look it up on the internet. Because you want to know. You want to know. And you want to make a decision that is an informed decision informed by some knowledge. Um, and in some things we have to have scientific knowledge now. Uh, if you want to have a, a pizza, should that pizza have genetically modified tomatoes on top of it? That's a big question, isn't it? But you have to, you can't, I'll just go and ask an expert. You have to make that decision yourself. Uh, many parents have to make a, a decision um, if their children should be inoculated to prevent them getting, say, mumps or measles or rubella in one of those diseases. Uh, because there are risks attached, and, and that understanding of signs of risk in society is a scientific decision that you and I, not as experts, but just as ordinary human beings, have to now make. So democratic reasons are very important too. So uh, there are other reasons for we'll them, but I think those three are kind of good ones why science is important. Um, th there is a kind of government thing as well. I mean, part of my funding comes from the government to actually do this, so I, you know, I feel I've got to be supportive. Um, they, uh, these are two phrases I like. Um, one of them is what's called horizon scanning. Horizon scanning. If you imagine you're on a, sh on a ship and you're looking out, and out across the sea, you would scan the horizon to see what the next big ship or iceberg or problem might be. And what we're meant to do in popularizing science or talking to the public about science is trying to work out what the next big idea might be. Now the reason for that was that it was a problem 
People didn't realize, for example, that genetically modified organisms would suddenly appear. Um, in Britain, people didn't realize that, if you like, the mad cow disease would suddenly appear as a problem. And as a result, the public were frightened and, and, and worried, uh, quite understandably, about these. Um, but also, it then affected confidence in companies and so on. And the government doesn't like instability. They like us to spot something coming. So if the next big idea was, I don't know, cows with six legs, because you get, I don't know, perhaps, yeah, that'd be okay, wouldn't it? Um, cows with six legs. Um, it would be important to inform the public about it very early, so people weren't suddenly frightened when they saw one. So we could have a debate. Should we have cows with six legs? I don't know. I think we should. With we'll more meat. Oh, I don't know. How will we milk them? You know, that kind of question. And so what we then do is what's called upstream education. It means we, we talk to the general public about these ideas, new ideas, early on. So they get an idea. They're, they're, they're not frightened when, when they come to fruition. So, but also, they can have a debate and say, well, actually, I don't think it's a very good idea at all. I think six legs is just two legs too many. You know, we should have, you know, that sort of thing. Perhaps five legs, we compromise, should have five legs. <laughs> so that's how, how we, we, you know, that's the kind of debate that we could have, okay? So that, those are kind of important phrases. Uh, the picture there on, on the right-hand side are um, some children engaged in an activity we do an awful lot of. Uh, I am currently responsible for looking after something like 600 scientists and engineers who volunteer to simply go into schools and be themselves, just to be a scientist and engineer. We're quite used to the idea of sending a, perhaps a musician into a school or a dancer into a school, but we send engineers into schools. And what do they do? They have to have something to do when they get there. And so we get them to work with young people, possibly here to build structures or to do various other things. Um, on the right hand side there, he's, a, he's quite a famous engineer. He's the great, great grandson of Joseph Brammer, who you may not have heard of, but he was the man who invented the hydraulic press. And um, he's an engineer himself, and he's talking to some engineers, some pupils engaged in engineering projects there. Interestingly, the, the, the the group he's talking to there are a group of girls who, um, their engineering project involved them making hats. Doesn't sound like engineering to me, but it is. Textile technology. But why their project was such a good project was they knew how to make hats. They used computer designs to cut them and all that kind of thing. They worked, but they worked out how much each hat would cost. They worked out what the profit would be on each hat. So by the time they'd finished, they could sell hats and make a profit. So they understood what engineering was about, right from the materials right through to selling. It's kind of good. Um, what are some questions that you might want to think about? If we're in this position where we're talking to the public about science and technology and engineering and mathematics, it would be very easy for me to be in a position where I simply told people what they should think. That's not a very good thing, though. I go around telling people what they should think. So I can inform people, I can tell people about, or I can get other people to tell people about things. Um, should I advise them? Where you sometimes, we do advise people, we say, smoking, it's bad. Don't smoke. That's advice, isn't it? Okay. Um, I don't think I could say eating meat is bad. Is it? Eating people is bad. Where? Mostly, mostly bad. <laughs> um, but you know, but that, that we could have a discussion about that, couldn't we? So sometimes there's a tension between giving information, which is neutral, and giving advice, which is not neutral, and that's a, an interesting question. Um, it does mean that when I'm talking to the public, and actually we are all members of the public, because none of us know everything. So we're all members of the public, really. Um, it means, what do I think about the public? Are the public people who simply don't know things? And I need to tell them. So that's a, what we would call a deficit model. That you don't know, I do know, I tell you. Okay? 
that's perhaps not a very good model to have. We tend much more to have what might be called a constructivist model, which is that um, you know things, I know things. I wonder if what you know is like what I know. Let's have a discussion about it. And then we have that discussion and we construct knowledge that way. Um, one of the things that, that we do with that, one of the things that I do around right about once a month is on our local radio station, local BBC radio station, uh, we do a program called, uh, well it's called Ask the Expert, which I'm a bit worried about because I don't really feel I'm much an expert really. But uh, we also call it, uh, sometimes they call it Ask the Boffin. The Boffin, a Boffin, we don't know this word at all, it's an English word. A boffin is a kind of, um, it's like a cartoon scientist. It's a scientist with funny hair and a white coat. It's a horrible word, really. And I don't, we said, don't call us boffins. So then said, oh, we will call you experts. Oh, we think that's slightly worse. And I, I, I'm the physicist and we have a chemist and a biologist. And the general public pick up the telephone and they phone in questions. And we try to answer them. And sometimes there'll, there'll be questions like, um, where's the middle of the universe? Not sure. And uh, when we, we have a discussion about that, or if a frying pan is non-stick, why does a non-stick surface stick to the frying pan? So I have to say, I'll to my chemist friend, I say, you know, at that point. And we have uh, uh, lots of, of questions like that. Some, they, they ask us rude questions and all sorts of things. Now, in a way, it doesn't really matter if we really know the answers or not. We try our best to know the answers. But if we don't, we admit it. And what they like to hear is the three of us talking and trying to work out the problem. Because it's a way of trying to see inside a scientist's head and to see how scientists think. And sometimes we do well. Um, the last time we did it, uh, there was a, a really strange question, which was this, and I'll, I'll let you think about this, and I'll finish that one. The question was this, man phoned in, and we had a hello, and he said, is it true that uh, human beings are the only animals that are born without knees? So we, we said, so sorry, could you say that again? Are, are the only animals that are born without knees? And so we, we have, you know, had a look down and I just had these. And um, so we, we, we weren't sure about this. And so we, it completely confused us. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I saw my colleague, my colleague who's a biologist, perhaps she would know. She said, no, don't, don't ask me, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and the chemist, he was. <laughs> and, and so we went on. And, and I think, because I panicked really, I said, well, um, well, knees perhaps are different in different animals, and I mean, um, dogs, don't their knees go backwards or something, you know, and well, this was the wrong thing to say, because I, I don't know much about dogs. Um, a few minutes later, a man phoned in and said, I'm so angry, I had to stop the car. Doesn't that idiot me? <laughs> Doesn't that idiot know anything about dogs? So that's not the dog's knee at all. It's the dog's ankle. So I, in a big part of it, well, I'm terribly sorry, um, but I thought it was so wonderful that there was a man who was so angry that he had to stop his car and tell me I was an idiot. So I thought it was rather good. So I'll, uh, I'll stop at that point and let you ask me some questions. Is that okay? Yes, sure. Thanks. So, uh, yes, we're open for questions, comments, whoever wants to ask something. Sometimes it is very difficult to make decisions, to be responsible. Uh, for example, when I visit, uh, visit my doctor, uh, I need to sign that I was informed and I agree with his uh, suggestion. But it is very difficult to, to sign it and to sign that I was informed of what it means. Because, for example, sometimes he suggests, okay, you need an operation and I can do it this way or this way. And, and he asked me what to what I prefer, but it is very difficult. So my usual answer is, if I wear your wife, or if I wear your daughter, what would you do, what would you suggest for me? So I think it's not very responsible answer, but uh, what shall I do, shall I study uh, medicine, disease, or uh, it's not so easy to, uh, to make qualified decisions. 
Do you want to summarize that in Slovak? Or I think they, should I say that in Slovak? They understood you. They, I'm sure that I'm, they understood my English. She speaks better English than you do. So true, right? So that's right. Um, I think it's I think it's actually a very important area. This business of what has happened to the expert. Um, some years ago, it was the case that I think people, not just in, in Britain, but probably around the world, accepted what an expert told them. So a doctor would simply say, do this, and people would do it. And we would accept their viewpoint as being important. But I think modern life has changed quite a bit, and people don't always respect it like the expert. That, that can be a good thing. That can be a good thing. Um, the difficulty is, and, and I think Jana's put a finger on the problem importantly, is where we have to make a, a, a difficult decision, simply being informed, that's that problem of informing versus advising, simply being informed doesn't actually always help. Um, I think we all are often in that position, none of us are really experts, and sometimes it can be kind of nice for a doctor to say, look, let me just tell you, do this. I'll go and do it and be all right. Um, but actually, we know that there are cases where doctors give the wrong advice. So it's partly to do with the scientific understanding of risk. Um, when you go into hospital now, we, we, uh, we probably have to sign a piece of paper that says, I accept that I might die or something, you know, something, something terrible might happen. Not because it's likely you will, but because there is a risk. But we don't know whether that's a, a big risk or a small risk. Certainly in the United Kingdom, the government's chief scientist says, says that one of the most important areas of education for the public is education about risk, so that people understand a little more about the mathemat mathematics of probability. Um, when we, we, you can see that if you take the, the lottery, if you buy a lottery ticket. You know, in Britain, for the chance of me winning the lottery, well, it's actually it's nil because I don't buy them, but if, it's, if I were to buy a lottery ticket, I think it's a, it's a chance of about 1 in 13 million. Okay? I know that I have a much greater chance of being run over by a, a horse or something, which is highly improbable, but it's more than... You know, enough number that, that happened number of hands. But we don't understand really the difference in, the, in, in those risks and probabilities. So I, I think how we work out risk is a very, very important thing. And how we inform people in that way is, is important too. Oh, that's, that's a bit of a stunner, wasn't it? Any other questions? Oh, no. No, no, no. May, I, may I actually add to this? Because it seems to me as if this was connected with some loss of the trust. Before you will just trust your doctor because your doctor is an educated man, he studied medicine and he yes. has experience. So why should I decide about these? It's, it's very difficult questions actually that the doctors decide. So I will trust him and that will help me. Now it seems like I don't trust this educated men, I want to decide these things for myself, which are very, very, you know, very hard decisions. And there, I think, there are cases where people just decide wrongly, and if they would trust the doctors, then the outcome yeah. would be better if they don't. So, is this really good that we want to make I, these decisions? I think, I, I think it, it is a difficult area to actually explore. I mean, that, that, that loss of trust is, is quite right. Um, I think attitudes towards um, science are, can be problematic at times. Sometimes we see a problem and we assume that science is the cause. You know, you, you talk about, I don't know, global warming. And so, well, it's all those so scientists, you know, that, that's what people assume scientists. You cause this. Well, actually, that's not the case, is it really? It's the scientists who are actually working hard to find the solutions if global warming is an, an, a human thing. Um, so, very often, it's science that is perceived as the problem rather than as the route to the solution. Uh, and I think that's, that's probably because of the way that culture has dealt with science. Um, 
it, it's interesting that everything sort of scientific and technological has a, a two-edged element. You know, we, we worry about, at the moment, we're very worried about nuclear power. Yeah? A few decades ago, we were very worried about nuclear weapons. But the, 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 the technology of nuclear energy weapons is also technology of nuclear power. The technology of um, pain-relieving drugs is also the technology of addictive drugs. So we, we do have a moral responsibility um, in any of the science and technology we do. We can't escape that. Um, I'll keep going talking forever. Yeah. <laughs> Well, everybody's happy to uh, welcome to ask, of course. May I? Sure. I just wanna, uh, you said that we lost the trust in the in the specialists, but that's pr probably because the specialists use the language that common people won't understand. When you, for example, talk about the, uh, nu the nuclear uh, accident in Fukushima, we had a press conference given by mm. uh, our institute, and there were like reporters sitting there, and uh, all the experts uh, from uh, environmental uh, uh, field uh, said like this is like this many sievers, this many sievers, and uh, then the reporters were saying like, Duh? and just writing down the numbers, you know. Then then the then the paper came out, and scientists proved that this uh, this uh, pollution was this high, which means that we're gonna die. And uh, I mean, the problem is not not the the trust, but we we have lost the trust because we cannot speak to the public in a proper way. Yeah. We use the language too much of our self. I mean, our common uh, language in our in our society. For example, physicists use you know use you know shortcuts, you know, and then you have to go to and talk to a reporter, and then you um, you cannot actually tell him what what you're doing. For example, if he would ask me, uh, so what's what's what, what what's your what's your work about, and and. and well, it's a relativistic hydrodynamics and a... <laughs> yeah, I think that's very, very true, actually. One, one of the things... Well, I'll tell you a joke, actually. We are, we are all adults, I think. Yeah, I'll tell you very slowly. <laughs> um, it was told... When I was... I used to be in the physics department, uh, when we had one. And um, one of my colleagues, who actually I taught when he was a schoolboy, told me this joke. He said, what does a physicist use as a contraceptive? His personality. <laughs> and I think. Well, um, I think what he was suggesting was I think what you're saying is that many scientists hide behind difficult words and difficult ways of behaving, which isn't always very helpful. One of the. Um, tasks I do when I'm training engineers to go and talk to, in schools, when I get them together like this, we ply them with coffee for a while, and then the first task I say to them, I say, I want you to explain to your colleague what it is you do. Okay? But I want you to do that in language that a 14-year-old would understand. Now, this is actually very, very difficult. Um, if you, in Britain, we have new, you have newspapers, and we have some very good newspapers like the Times and the Guardian, and we have some dreadful newspapers, the tabloid newspapers. Now, the reading age for a tabloid newspaper, I think, is about ten. Okay, you got to be the, if you're a ten-year-old, you can read it. Okay, it's actually much more difficult to write for a tabloid newspaper than it is to write for the Times. If you're writing in the Times you're writing for people like you. If you're writing about economic policy or nuclear accidents in the language of a 10-year-old, that's a very hard job to do. What I suggest you do now, while well, I just have a little broad pause, is turn to your neighbor and explain to them what you do. But can you do it in the language of a 14-year-old, please? Just do that now. Go on. Turn around, talk to each other. <laughs> and then I'll ask someone to go around and tell us what, what was said. Go, don't be shy. Some water. 
Ja som sa vás chcel spýtať, tu chodíte všetké z
They love the idea of the Triceratops or the Brontosaurus or the uh, Ter Teranosaurus Rex. So they, they love those words. When we put those lectures on, very small children will come. They'll come carrying dinosaurs. They'll come wearing dinosaur pajamas. They'll be so excited. Um, similar with astronomy. If we get a, a good, one of our best astronomical lectures we had, he just showed a few PowerPoint pictures. But it was in, enthralling, it was wonderful. It was in like, uh, the majesty of the heavens and all that kind of thing. But he, was, he, was a, he, used, he didn't shirk the words, he used the words accurately, but explained them. He didn't hide behind them, he explained them. That's good. Is it, is it actually really the words that are so attractive for the people, or is it something? Because both these things are something very distant from us. It's mm. something going, well, in a sense, deep and wide. And yeah. it's like, you know, the, the quest of, uh, however you want to call it, human spirit to, to yeah. know more and explore. I think, yeah, you're, you're right. There's a sense of what, um, is it Otto, the um, theologian, called the numinous, the numinous. That which is outside, outsiders, things that we we do sense a sense of awe and wonder about the universe, you know, from the very small to the very large. And so I, I think that that's quite right. And I think that if science lost that sense of being awe-inspiring, there'd be something wrong with science. Um, sometimes I think teachers can sometimes kick the interest out of science. So just kick science to death, you know, the classroom. Yes, please. And when you communicate with uh, pupils or with public in general, uh, what kind of questions are the most difficult for you? Oh, yes, I mean, obviously there are those questions where I simply don't know, and they're always incredibly difficult. Um, we do get some sort of kind of peculiar ones. I mean, often people don't want to... Science is very good at answering questions about how and what. You know, how, how do the colours of the rainbow, how are they formed, you know, that, that kind of question. Um, you know, how is the blue sky formed? Um, but people often ask the question, why? And that's a much more difficult question, that's a theological question, really, um, to find the reason for things. And, and that's a, they're much harder questions. So, we, we um, the, the, a very popular question is, is time travel possible? I see we seem to get this asked on the radio at least once every month. Is time in one way or another, is time travel possible? And what I always say is, in a sense, um, you're travelling through time now. Um, if you look at the universe around you, of course, all you physicists would know that what you see is not there. It was there. A star that is the nearest star was the or what you see was there a year ago. Uh, it may be several thousands and millions of years ago for a more distant star. So what we see now, what we see on this, this kind of bit of the planet, is a very small subset. And I think it's important to say that, 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 that science isn't necessarily about knowing how everything is. It's sometimes knowing what the limits to our knowledge is, or limits are. I'm just kidding. Horizon, actually, you talked about the scanning of the horizon. Yeah, no, no, no. scanning the horizon all the time, actually, and watching for more questions. Yes, yeah, very good. <laughs> there's, there's, there's always one person in the audience who does this. <laughs> I can tell you my experience. I was at a conference, and there was a lady from Amsterdam, and she was talking about Einstein, and she was talking about the supposed to give me a question. So now, five minutes, think of one question, and then I will ask, I will ask Helena, I will Stano, ask me questions. So everybody yeah. is uh, able to ask questions, because if, question I don't, and she said, if, I, if I don't uh, use this uh, approach, uh, only the same people from the audience would ask questions. And when you are at the conference, you know that uh, Boris is active at some and if, and if you don't ask a question, we won't let you go home. My question is, when you, you are a priest also, so, yeah. and I think that your people from your parish, they, they know that you are a scientist also, so do they ask you scientific questions? And vice versa, do 
people mm. from your right ask you a religion question? And yes. I mean, in a sense, yes, because you can't switch off and on different parts of your life. You are hopefully a fairly integrated human being, and what you are in one case is what you are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I found when after I became a priest, um, it was quite, quite interesting. People who I didn't expect came to talk to me at work, who were, who were scientists, you know. I have a very good relationship with a friend of mine who was a Muslim, and he tries to convert me to Islam on a regular basis, but he's, we have big discussions there. Um, and then people often, you know, as people do in a natural way, if they have a problem with their life, will not, won't talk to me about science. They'll, I, I'm expecting them to ask me a physics question, and they say, what should I do about my son, you know, or something like that. Uh, and so they have that kind of question. Um, and I think the other side of that is that um, it is important, I think, for science and religion to talk to each other. And so I, I was, I was, I'm part of a science and religion group. We had a, a fascinating talk from um, um, uh, my colleague at the other university, who was a reader in physics, um, about, I suppose, physical evidence for the existence of God in the universe. And that was good. He did it in lots of equations. We didn't understand it. But it was really good. It was kind of good. Um, so I think that dialogue is very, very important. Um, and I think it was partly lost in Britain because of the way British philosophy was organised in, in the 19, early part of the 20th century. I think now there is a dialogue again, which is good. There are some eminent scientists who are like me. I'm just not really eminent, I'm just a science teacher. Really. You've got very quiet now. Yes, hello. 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 You, you talked about this, you also talked about the radio program when you talked to mm. each of uh, people and so it's, it's actually there on the on this slide that, that you have this this deficit in constructive model and you yeah. rather provide information and advice and talked about this approach that you that you you treat the people as partners so to say, not I'm yeah. telling you the truth but so what do you do then with these people who will just pick the phone and start with the sentence, you know, the third Newton's law is evidently wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, which people do. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of what, what is often called pseudoscience about, you know. Um, with, with that, I mean, the, the benefit of constructivism is they accept that they know something, but what they know might not be very good. And so we have to start where they are. And I would then have a dialogue and say, well, what is it about Newton's third law that you say is not right? And they would say a little bit. They said, but then he would ask a few more questions and say, well, why is that? And, and perhaps put counter evidence before them and, and hopefully lead them through to a thing that is more normally scientific. But scientists do this themselves. I was once at a, a chairing, like you do, I did a big conference um, where we, we got a, a lecture on, and it just had to coincide at our lecture, the lecture was being given by a very nice man who was the expert on uh, test tube babies, on in vitro fertilization. He's a very eminent scientist. Uh, he gave his talk, and uh, somebody asked a question. Um, at the same time as our lecture was a, a big conference of blood specialists who came to the lecture. We didn't know this, they just came. And the question was a, a very detailed question about the uh, <coughs> the blood in the baby's body or something, you know, and, and how this, and he said, well, I, honestly, I, I just don't really know. I don't know, he said, God, that's very complicated, I don't know. And so he answered it, and uh, he tried to answer it, but said he couldn't answer, he didn't understand. And then one of the, someone who was in the audience says, well, actually, I'm the expert on this. Hmm. And, and said what he thought it was. Very long answer. A moment later, and someone at the other side of the audience said, that's complete nonsense. I'm the expert in this. And there was a wonderful, what is more interesting than our lecture, there's a wonderful argument between these two people who thought they both knew the scientific truth, and they were the experts. And that was kind of good, because even sometimes the experts are still constructing scientific truth. The science isn't fixed, it's kind of being, being put together. And it's good to see that happen. I think it was more, for me, it was a, a wonderful example of what we call science in the making, and the boundaries of science. Um. We had a, oh, sorry, uh, we just 
government with a lecture uh, one month ago, and the title was Why Formula P equals MC quadrat is not correct. Right. And a lot of people uh, came just to, to have a look why it is not correct. And so it was very nice lecture. Oh, for missing the rest Genial. Yes, it was our colleague, and then the people were disappointed. It was a lot of math, but it was a nice lecture, actually. Yeah. But the title was perfect. Yes. I remember the man who taught me relativity, um, taught it in the usual kind of way, because you have to, uh, and then said, I think it was the Michelson Morley experiment, um, which is, Mr. Shows, for those who are interested in this kind of thing, is meant, was trying to detect ether drift. And it wasn't detected, and therefore there is, there is no ether. And he said, well, actually, there is. <laughs> uh, and he said, well, all it, all it shows is that there's, if you want to be technical, a Lorentz contraction of the instrument, and it cancels itself out because of the ether. But don't tell anybody I told you. So it's kind of interesting. Right? There was a question, and I'll try to rephrase that. So you're traveling a lot also, and you've been to Slovakia, I have said. Poland, Hungary, I think, South yes, Africa, yes, UK. Uh, do you do you observe or do you think there are any differences between the, the pupils, the school pupils, in the sense like how how they're interested in science and how much in, in depth they want to go or, or you know, how they uh, touch it? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, in many ways, I mean, many ways, I think young people are young people. I mean, they're they're they're, they're the same kind of around the world, really. Um, it, it, when we, one of the, some of the work we've, we've done, we've looked, we've compared um, international scores, you know, with, with, with the TIMS stuff where you look at uh, how school children perform in different countries. And one of the things um, I was interested in was when I was working in Finland. Finland always comes out top of the scores. It's, you know, it's always used as a model for um, uh, how schools should be organised. In fact, in Britain, we're kind of adopting some of the, that kind of model. Um, but I, I, I constantly didn't see anything that was different to what anyone else teaches, to be honest, except um, the classes were smaller. So instead of, uh, as tradition and norm in Britain, you might teach 30 children, they were teaching 12 children. And I think that matters in terms of how the personal relationship between a good teacher, and I think it's a good teacher, and the pupil is, is very important. It is difficult when you've got large groups. I think there are differences. We, we emphasize um, practical work, that um, pupils should do practical experiments in the classroom. Um, I, 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 one interesting thing I saw, I, I had a student who was placed teaching science and mathematics at a school in France. And I went along to observe, and she was teaching in French to her pupils, to observe her in action. That's very good. But she did a practical where she was wanted to do a dissection of the nerves of a frog's leg. Um, now, in Britain, if we do that kind of activity, if a child says, I, I, I object to cutting up an animal, we have to, it's, it's important we find them something else to do. Uh, I asked the teacher, I said, what do you do if the child doesn't want to cut up an animal? And she said, well, we, we send them home. Send them home. Uh, which I think was a very different approach to in, in Britain. Also was very different was that in order to acquire the frog's legs, we would, in Britain, have to uh, write some forms and organize a special delivery from the scientific suppliers. Um, in France, you just go down to the supermarket and buy them. <laughs> and it was a good lesson, by the way. Do you have a question? No, yes, sir. Answer. Okay. Um, I discuss the uh, success of Finnish uh, pupils mm -hmm. with my Finnish colleague, and he said that uh, they are successful because they read a lot. And mm -hmm. I'm surprised, so they really do they read a lot. I, I was thinking of reading books, and he said, no, they, they are watching TV all the time when they come home mm -hmm. from school. And because of their strange language, they they need to read subtitles to understand. Yes. And then that's why they are very good in reading. And when they solve piece, uh, problems from Pisa, there, there is uh, usually a lot of words, and you need to read, and then you you can solve the problem. 
and our students, for example, our pupils at schools, they fail because they are not good in reading. They can they can read, but they don't understand what they are reading. So uh, that's the problem. I think I think that's, that's the explanation from. Yeah, I think it's very, it's a very sensible explanation. I think there's also if you, if you look at if you do a comparison between the um, employment sectors in those countries, um, because of Nokia, one company really in. Uh, Finland, it dominates the employment in, in there, so it has a very large technical sector, larger than comparative countries. Our, in Britain, our largest employer is the National Health Service. And it's the largest employer in the world, I think, you know, second only to the Indian Railways. But, um, but in, in Finland, it's a smaller country, it has one significantly large employer, and that means that there's a greater emphasis on technical education, I think. But actually, the activities they do, I think literacy, I think, is, is very important, quite right. There is actually one more question from the audience, <coughs> which is connected to the disaster at Fukushima now. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it wasn't me. About <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your opinion about, about building these, um, yeah. these nuclear power plants in the, in the area, which, which obviously is a seismic, it's close yeah. to, the, to the sea, and uh, so one might have expected that a disaster like this uh, would happen. Yeah, um, I, I think that there are two aspects to the question. I, I mean, broadly, I'm actually quite in favour of nuclear power, personally. It's a personal choice, um, because um, although I think it's important to have green, you know, wind power, sea power, and so on, uh, it's not reliable, I, I, and there are problems, I think, with a kind of um, carbon economy that we have at the moment. So I think probably we have to move towards um, safe nuclear alternatives. Safety is the issue. Um, at first, when 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 the nuclear the, the problem happened in Fukushima, uh, Fukushima happened, I felt kind of encouraged at first because I thought they've just had a, a nuclear reactor that's been hit by an earthquake and a tsunami and it survived. But it seems to be in the management of the problem thereafter that has been a difficulty. Um, it may be that the dominance of particular kinds of design of reactor is a problem. I, I've always been a bit of a, a fan of the, the Canadian deuterium uranium, the Kandu reactor, which I think fails in a more safe kind of way, in my humble opinion. Um, so it may be that the pressurized water reactors aren't, which are the that's because they're cheap and the, the technology is well known. It is is a kind of interesting one. I, I think I was, I was talking to the, the Finns. I think they're having a nuclear reactor built by using the French design. And the difficulty they're having is that people, it's to do with local knowledge. It's this an issue. You think, why on earth did they build a reactor on, in a seismically active field? It, I don't know which design they used. Was it a Westinghouse design? I don't know. Um, the one in Finland, I think they, the, the French engineers didn't understand how cold it was in Finland. And we're having difficulties actually getting concrete to set in the correct way to, before they, they, they built the thing. And it, was, it was taking a very long time to do this. But I think we, we um, in Britain, of course, you know, we uh, had the first world's first nuclear reactor at wind scale. And in the 1950s, we had a similar major problem that released radioactive iodine into the, into the atmosphere. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's how societies deal with this. I think the problem in Japan was partly to do with secrecy and government response and pretending there wasn't a problem. When if they said there was a problem and did something about it early, it might have been better. I don't know. I, I don't know enough about Japan to be able to speak with any authority. I'm scanning the horizon. Actually, uh, this is also something I wanted to ask about, the scanning of the horizon. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it seemed to me like you're talking about preparing the public for for ideas or problems that might appear. Well, how do you know what appears actually beyond the horizon? Because the, yeah. it's connected to research, and the research is sometimes full of surprises. So, so if that's it surprises right. you there, how do you know? I, that, that's right. I mean, I think sometimes it's, it's a kind of hope that government has that somehow we will be able to predict things. Um, I, th I suppose something like nanotechnology, um, where that development was kind of, originally was an accident, really, was that people found, say, carbon-60 
molecules where they shouldn't have been. Um, but out of that, the technology is beginning to grow. Now, it may be that, that technology could be a, a significant technology that we do now need to be developing, and perhaps government needs to be putting money into those kinds of industries, because if one country doesn't, another country will. So it may be so that that could be um, so that is, is a significant kind of thing. I think there's a whole area of um, artificial intelligence and how that will act, interact with the brain. You know, we, we're already seeing the situation where um, implants for the eye can now be electronically signals can go into the brain and get kind of vision can be restored kind of thing. Um, and it may be that there, there are kind of some interesting moral and ethical issues about. What point does uh, you know a computer have a kind of right to life? At uh, what point does a human stop being human and become not? Um, you know, because we can replace so much now in the body, can't we? You know. So they, I think they're, they're perhaps long distant things. Um, yeah. Well, I would like to, to give you an example. Say, from my field of research, is actually any time that we start running a new accelerator, there are always doom scenarios oh, yeah. on the market. So, so the, the, the most recent one was that when we start to run the LHC, then certainly the black hole will be created and the whole world will collapse. And you could see the videos on YouTube this happening, actually. Um, so, so how should one actually deal with this? Because that, that is the kind of publicity, and I would say, so this, because there are real scientific scenarios which actually, which actually say that well maybe this is a possibility if you say that the world is not three but seven dimensional and ta -ta -ta. Mm -hmm. so there are many conditions. Yeah. It's very improbable if there are people knowing about this. Nobody really believes that this would be true, yeah. but you can't exclude this. And and this very exotic thing which nobody in the scientific community actually believes makes so much fuss within the public that there are lawsuits against CERN somewhere in Hawaii. Yeah. And so how should I treat this? Well, good question, isn't it really? Um, I think that there are, um, it's, it's interesting with the public generally, isn't it, that, that there are some aspects of science fiction that are better believed, or more widely believed by the public than science fact. I think a lot of the sort of Star trek -y views of interstellar travel, you know, are People believe that that's just around the corner, when it's probably highly impossible. Um, the way in which gravity seems to be locally operating on any spaceship that works through, you know, flies through, you know, space, it is 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 kind of interesting thing there. But I think this this whole problem about how do we deal with the danger? The danger always makes more more news, doesn't it? It's the way we tell the story to uh, the press. If you say, well, yeah, there's a slight, like, minuscule chance that there might just be a black hole or something, you know, oh, right, right, black hole there, you see. But that's a news story. But if you say, well, actually, it'll all work perfectly, where's the, where's the news in that? You know, so I think sometimes scientists have to be a little, there can be a little naive, a little um, childlike at times in their, their belief in what they do. They've got to, perhaps scientists have a, need to have more training in communication, in working with the press, and thinking, what is the story I want to tell here? Um, and what's the accurate element of the story? Um, we, we often hear things in the press, not because they're particularly significant scientifically, but simply because it's interesting. It's, it's what we call a sexy story, not because it's good science. I can say, I think there are labs where scientists are actually Forbidden to talk to the journalists, so because there are because there are design people who know how to talk to journalists, so that not some some rumors spread. That's right. Yes. I have a question. Would anybody like anything to drink? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because I can see that we have no glasses, no cups. Yeah. Ja to pravim, če chcete nekdo nečo This is like the, the most. Exhausting job interview I've ever had. So that we're not offering you a job. It's <laughs> <laughs> like every other interview I've ever had. Then, yeah. The coffee, if I may. Coffee yeah. with milk, without milk. Without. Without. <laughs> 
to jest mleka, a czaj, Can we actually have more music, maybe? Just refresh the brains. They are ready, yeah. And so don't you know that it's a problem as a brush coffee as you wish and as much tea as you wish? So shall we have a little break with the music? Yes.
think he's gone. So, Richard, we have some yes. questions. Really. Oh, excellent. Uh, so, it shows a bit of chance to do as a That's excellent, by the way. Well, did you check chance? Uh, Green sleeves. This, so, th this one brings us to the previous question. How do you suggest to, how do you suggest working out the Fukushima problem? Well, the poetry was left to me. Well, I don't know. Um, how do you, how do you, do you resolve the problem? Uh, uh, I'm, well, let me see. Uh, the, if I were in that position, I was trying to think back to many years ago, I did do a course on reactor physics, which was about 35 years ago, this course, so not, I can't remember very much of it. Um, I suppose that the, the difficulties are limiting risk, isn't it? Clearly, the, the reactors themselves will never work again. They're, 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 they're dead now. Um, and where does the risk present itself? It seems the risk now is partly through the way the um, cores are being treated. Uh, there hasn't, it seems, been a proper meltdown as such, so there's not that massive release of, of radioactive material. That, that's actually, it shows a bit of a success. I think in a few years' time, people might say this was actually quite successful. You know, because you take four nuclear reactors, you shake them to bits, and then dump a lot of water on them and they still survive is probably kind of, kind of a good thing. Um, I mean, I suppose at the end of the day that the, the risk will, will, as we always do, we do it by dilution, don't we? They, they, they dump the water into the sea, the things get dissipated in the air, and so on. Um, the the long-term problem will be, will it be, will it be possible to actually use nuclear power in the same kind of way. It's cause that Britain has, for example, has decided to build more nuclear reactors, but that is now being questioned, and it wasn't really being questioned until Fukushima. Um, I, I think perhaps a few months down the line, people might be able to look at that and say, actually, it's possible to build a nuclear reactor. You can expose it to an earthquake, you can expose it to a, a tsunami, and it's kind of surviving. That might be reassuring for people who don't live in earthquake areas. It, it does raise some questions about whether Japan should do it in the way they did it, but that's. But for example, in England you have in Sellafield you have yeah, the yeah. you have the, the whole facility to to to, to reprocess. Yeah, yeah, reprocess, and uh, you release all the the, the the substances into the into the uh, Irish Sea. Irish Sea, yeah. Mm. So yeah, the, 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 there's a, a higher plutonium. Pure, pure coincidence, of course, um, in, in the Irish Sea than, than anywhere else. Um, I don't think we release it per se into the Irish Sea. I think it's not meant to go in the Irish Sea, really. But I know it does. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Sellafield is, is, is um, a case in point, really. I mean, it is somewhere, these, where else do you <coughs> reprocess fuel? fuel? It has, has to be done. Um, it, and that's kind of what they do, and that's because that was they, they were set up in that first way. It was also a problem because there was that uh, originally it was set up not really to produce civil nuclear power, but to be part of the nuclear weapons program and to enrich uranium. But um, so that there's a kind of moral problem there. Um, yeah, I, I think as an area, it's it's relatively stable geologically. So I think that the processes of vitrification of waste. What about the public? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the public... Um, is it aware that this... I, th I think the Sellafield, the Sellafield did use to spend a vast amount of money on education. Um, now, whether it's edu education or propaganda is, is, a, is a quite a, an interesting question. We, we do a lot of work ourselves as a company, as a, company, as a university, with companies um, to help them with their education. And we, we sometimes have these moral dilemmas. You know, we work with companies who want to produce um, a positive view about what they, they, they do and do that using science education. Um, we, in a sense, have to try and be neutral on some of these issues and try and show balance. But it is difficult, because uh, certainly if we're doing that and we're paid to do that. Um, we, we had a wonderful thing where we did some work um, with the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industries. This, this used to be called British Drug Houses. Um, and they make pharmaceuticals, they make medicines. And we, we wrote some very good stuff about this, but we, part of the deal was that we would, they would pay us, we would write the materials, but we were not allowed to use the word drug. 
anywhere because drug has a negative connotation, negative meaning. So we did, we wrote the education materials, but we used words like pharmaceutical, like medicine, you know, cure, positive words. Um, now, there's a, you know, a little bit of kind of, well, should we have perhaps be a bit more balanced with that? You know? But it's, there's a, a bit of an issue about the industry itself. Its education budget tends to be, it's what it is now called, it's a kind of social and pub, um, public responsibility budget. It used to be called advertising. I would like to ask you a question. If, uh, you have to deal with, uh, with questions uh, concerning the, the problem of the war between the people around the intelligent design and uh, people around the new Darwinist. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, I, I, I belong to the Church of England, so we're fairly liberal on these things. Um, this has never been. Sorry? May I interrupt you? Because oh. maybe I could. Because I have a question which actually is related to this. The question is. You're a priest and you're also a scientist and mm -hmm. physicist. So what is your own uh, picture about the about how uh, the mankind was created on the Earth? Okay, right, I'll, tr I'll, try, and, I'll try and have a go at that. Um, I think if I start with your question first, then, then give me a chance to think about your question. The, um, in Britain, um, we've never really had a problem with the teaching of evolution in schools. It's never been a problem. It's never been a problem from the church's point of view, the Church of England's point of view. Um, Charles Darwin is buried in Westminster Abbey. Um, you know, we, we kind of embrace science in a good way. Um, the problem for us has been caused, it's only been caused really through um, American influence, which, which is a difficulty for us. It's interesting, that just a historical point, um, that the, the notion of religious fundamentalism came from a series of pamphlets that were published at the beginning of the 20th century called The Fundamentals. And these were meant to be kind of evangelical uh, tracts that explained what people should believe. And actually, those tracts at that time were broadly supportive of evolution as a view. Um, my personal view, I mean, I, 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 philosophically, I'm kind of... Um, uh, kind of support the views of um, the French philosopher who nobody reads these days, Henri Bergson, who was um, beginning of the 20th century, very much a modernist, wrote a book called um, L'Evolution Créatrice, Creative Evolution, that, that in a sense, through the natural scientific processes, we see the hand of God. We don't have to pretend, you know, the, the other things. Um, in, in that sense, we're coming now to your question there. Um, I think if you, if you look, the, the biblical record, I think it is very important. It's very important. To, it's a kind of truth. Uh, the truth it comes in a variety of forms, doesn't it? And poetic truth is very important. And we shouldn't forget poetic truth. That that um, the two creation stories that are in Genesis that come out of those two traditions are there uh, do tell some very very important truths about how we as human beings are. I think to, for a, a kind of fairly primitive society, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, to understand that human beings were made of the same stuff as the earth, you know, the word humus, human, of the same root, that we're made from the clay, that we're made of the same elements, is an incredible kind of conceptual le leap, isn't it? To say we are made of the same things as everything else when we don't look like anything there. So in that sense, that kind of truth is, is for me, is important. But I, I don't read the Bible as a science textbook. Uh, it's not written in that way. It was never it's not, it was not written in that kind of, the, the tradition didn't develop in that way. I think it's very poor theology to try and do that, and it's very poor science. So I, I'm kind of okay with the scientific narrative. Now, it's caused a bit of a problem, this, in Britain. Um, a friend of mine, who uh, Michael Rice, Professor Michael Rice, who is an Anglican priest, but he's professor of science education in London, uh, was also he actually had a job I once applied for. He was education um, director of education at the Royal Society in London, and he made a comment that um, if schools taught um, intelligent design and that kind of stuff, well, it, it wasn't the scientific view, but you shouldn't stop them teaching it. That was his view. 
Uh, unfortunately, there were people in the Royal Society who kind of, some of the fellows got together and were critical of him and forced him to, to leave his job. Interestingly, the one person who was supported him was Richard Dawkins, who's the, um, you know, the, the very arch sort of atheist, really. Um, because he said, actually, he listened to what um, Michael Rice had said. He didn't, but it was just heard, heard a different story. So um, I, I'm sometimes very upset when it becomes an issue in British schools. I have no problem with people teaching evolution in schools. I think that's the scientific story. And I think through that we see the hand of God, but that's me speaking as a man of faith and as a scientist. I have some, some few more questions here. Um, one question from Popular Science. What do you think about the combination of these words? Resources of the planet Earth, food production, water, number of the people living on this planet, and colonization. And as a note, don't talk about the Star, Star Trek, please. I won't talk about that. <laughs> I won't talk about that, about that program. Um, some years ago, I was on a, a committee, a committee of the Royal Society, in fact, with um, Martin Rees, the astronomer royal. He's now Lord Rees. Um, he's and he's a very good astronomer, you know, far better than ever I will ever do anything. Um, but he, he has said that you know, actually, the future of mankind does lie in the stars. That you know, that we, we all know that, that there will come a time when our, our sun will expand and will swallow up this planet, we will you know, just disappear um, from a scientific point of view. And so, if humankind, in, in, in that view, is to, to survive, it would have to colonize elsewhere. But the difficulties are, though, those difficulties are of enormous distances. We have to find ways of traveling, probably traveling for many generations of human beings in space, in sort of micro planets or something. Well, but I'm trying not to touch on the Star Trek thing here um, before, because of the time scales that are involved. Um, I think it is always, always kind of interesting, isn't it, that, that you know, the, the SETI program, the, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has, seems to have found nothing. You know there? Well, Earth, I mean, it's doubtful, isn't it, how intelligent we are, but it's just found nothing when there's, you know, when there's such a restricted set of wavelengths through which information can be gathered and you have kind of almost infinite amount of time in which to take it and yet nothing is there so it, it's very kind of lonely out here isn't it on our little bit of a rock and so in that sense all of these things that you're saying about um, on the one hand we know that the earth com will come to an end that's that other great kind of theological insight that it doesn't last forever um, but there's also that sense that we could just about destroy it ourselves. We have that capacity now, in a way that we never had before. And it may be that the, and I think Martin Rees has certainly made this point, that the danger is, in a sense, the dangers of our own making. And it may be too much population. It could certainly be using of resources that, you know, that, that we can never afford to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic about that. I was very optimistic about the human race, but I think that, the biggest danger is actually what we ourselves can do rather than other things. But you said lonely, but we were setting program is running how many years? Well, yeah, so but that, that, that many light years we were. That's true, but, I mean, but on that basis, I mean, how many, yeah. you know, how many millennia have you had of other civilizations have had a chance to do what they do? You know, you just thought something, you know, a, a television program from. The planet Thar would have made its way here by now. You know, I mean, the, the thing that people will start picking up from us at this moment would be things like the television programs of the 1950s, would not they? You saw Contact by, uh, by no, Sagan. I no, I didn't actually. That with Carl Sagan. That should have done, shouldn't I? Really? Yeah. Popular science, you know. Like. Ah, yeah. Um, I have another question here. So you talked about the the topics which are favorite with the public and it's mm -hmm. universe and dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah. So so what do you think which which topics are, are more favorite or, or better for attracting the public to sciences? Is it from the history or from the future? Oh that's that's a good question actually. Um, hmm. I, I think in terms of things we've done recently, 
Um, where we've done things that are very at the cutting edge of research, we've we've had a, a reason a theme recently of of medical talks. So I had t t a couple of weeks ago, I had two big lectures organised where they attracted the first one organised it brought about 100 people just volunteered to come, and the second one about 300 people. So I'm kind of good. The first one was to, was a project dealing with um, the lungs. And it was about breathing, and there was doctors and researchers talking about breathing. And the people who came for that were people who got interest. Very often they got allergies or breathing disorders. So the general public was the general public, but they weren't so general. They were they had an interest, and it, and it fulfilled a useful role there. That was part of a wider project called um, Primitive Streak, which uh, the Primitive Streak, for those biologists will know is the first, when, a, when a, a fertilized egg starts to develop, it forms a kind of crease, and that crease becomes the central nervous system, it's the primitive streak. And they use that theme to produce an artist working with a scientist to produce a series of dresses. Kind of good. And these were on display for the public. And each dress dealt with um, a, an aspect of embryo development in the first thousand hours of life. The, the, the one we had a little bit of a problem with was, was, was the sperm dress. <laughs> which string was actually quite beautiful, really. Um, the, the artist had embroidered thousands of sperm onto a kind of a um, paper fabric, and then dissolved away the fabric to leave behind this beautiful lacy filigree. But somebody, one of the public, said, oh, this is terrible, how dare you do this sort of thing, you know? But it was rather good. Um, but the, the other dresses did not show other aspects of the nervous system and a lot of things. And so on, on those two lectures, the two aspects were, were fascinating. One was looking at a, a, a problem about breathing. The other was looking at, um, at what science says about how we are as human beings. And they were both, I thought, interesting. Arts and sciences together. The other big lecture we had was our own researchers who were doing a lot of work on brain research. And so they, they, they simply said, we're going to tell the public about what's happening in brain research now from a biological point of view. So there were five researchers and they talked about, if I get this right, um, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and two other things that can't remember. <laughs> but, but that was something. And we publicized it in that way. And they were fairly academic talks, really. But it, we got 300 people turned up just on a Friday night to watch this, to, to listen to the to, Tuesday night to listen to this, and um, it was quite clear when I was doing the questions. I I had to go around the audience and say, "Has anybody got a, an Alzheimer's question? Has anybody got a schizophrenia question?" And so on. Um, and then I said, "Well, we've done that. People want to leave. Do if you want to stay behind and talk to the researchers, they're keen. They'll, they'll do that." And so the, the talk actually then developed into five little groups talking about this. And we got people there who were there because they had a particular issue. We had to explain at the beginning of this that we will inform them about the science, but we're not going to advise them. And they've got to accept that, really, because it would have made put us in a very difficult position. But it was, it was fascinating and, and, and worthwhile. So you showed in a sense that that was cutting edge. It wasn't historical science. It was um, modern science. If somebody wants to ask a question, this is one of the last chances, actually. Before I have a lie down. Jedna otázka tu bola, môžem po slovensky. Pani sa pýta, že keď sa to natáča, že či sa to aj niekde využije, tak, no, ja neviem, čo si centrum... Centrum vedecko-technických informácií. Nejaké centrum, ktoré je napísané na plagáty, na dverách, budete vidieť. www.vedatechnika.sk www.vedatechnika.sk Na šestránky sa dá napísať. Nedá. Nedá. V vedeckej kaviarne bývajú aj v iných mestách, napríklad v Bratislave, a tie videonahrávky sa potom dávajú na webovú stránku toho centra, ktoré neviem, ako sa presne volá. Nevidela som tam e, naše videonahrávky z tých minulých kaviarní. Ešte nie sú spracované, Aha. lebo v Bratislave dostávajú príliš veľa z celého Slovenska, nestíhajú tam tam zachvačiť na stránku. Ale, ale vlastne tam je možné si pozrieť aj s inými osobnostiami, nie len teda, čo boli tu v Bystrici, ale aj z iných miest. 
Čiže a túto našu prednášku raz, dúfajme, že v Bratislave spracujú, a budete o rok sa môcť pozrieť, že čo, aké ste dneska niečo neporozumeli, tak si to tam v kľude vypočujete znovu. So, so, just to try, this was an information where this video will be posted on the web, so. I hope that the web page will be posted on the web, so. And so, I have one more question here, and the question is, what is the relation to physics, uh, science, and uh, technological problems of your, uh, of your wife and your daughter? Right, yes, thank you for that one. Um, my wife is also a priest uh, in the Church of England, um, but for 20 years she was an engineer, uh, so she, she worked for the steel industry, so she's, she's better at this than I am really, you know, she's a better mathematician than I am. Um, my daughters, I mean, they, they are, one is uh, a linguist, uh, but is working in museums and works in a science museum, uh, and so really deals with the public and with science and with engineering. And my younger daughter, who did psychology, is now retraining to be an orthoptist working in uh, mental things. So for them, I mean, they, they um, I think they, they see these things, I'm not if they're any special or different to anybody else really, but I think they do see these things now as more of an integrated whole, that, that life is not just science or art or science or religion or science or anything else. I think that, that there is a sense in which um, our lives to be complete human beings um, go together. That, that everything should be, we should be a bit of everything in order to be fully who we are, but that, that makes any sense. Um, for me, I suppose, the, when I think back to, you were saying various things I'd done in the past, one of the, first, one of the first things I did when I first became a philosopher was to look at what is education for? What's, what's the aim of education? And for me, the aim of education is the person. The person. Um, and there's a technical, kind of, technical kind of phrase. But it really means, and we ask then the question, what do we mean by the educated person? Is it somebody who, um, if you like, has just got a lot of knowledge or whatever, something like that? Or is it somebody who, as an individual, that's the thing, or is it somebody who is a part of society? And I think all this stuff about being, knowing about science and knowing about all these other things, it serves a bigger purpose, which is that we as individuals can function properly as members of society. And that, I think, is what education should aim for. I think our role as a teacher is very similar to our role as a parent. It's preparing people for a time when we are not there. If we've done a good job as a parent or as a teacher, we don't need to be there anymore. That's kind of important, really. So uh, that, for me, if you like, I'm being deeply philosophical, I suppose. That would, that would be to say, if I've been successful, if you've been successful, we, we're not needed anymore. Richard, I think this was a very nice word for the, for the ending. So let me thank you very much. And uh, I think this was a very enriching evening for us. And um, so let me give you a little thank you that we give to every guest. Guest in the scientific cafe, you see there is a poster oh, with you. Yes, it's going to be to my grandfather on it. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And we have a final tune of music.
Oh, 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 oh.